the Jurassic Parking of uh, the 1918 flu bacteria, uh, flu virus. But before we do that, um, I just want to say thank you to all the seniors that are here. This is your last journal club. So thank you for being so supportive and always being here at 7.30 in the morning for years now. Um, it's been awesome to have you guys, and we're going to miss you. And especially to Claire, who's been the head of Journal Club for two and a half years now, and she has made this what it is. We're so happy. So thank you, Claire. Um, Dr. Jones would like to be treated as a second-time presenter, even though she's never presented Journal Club before. She is going to be second-time presenter, so that means you can do clarification questions and a little bit of like more challenging questions, but nothing crazy, nothing Andrew level. Um, so here's Dr. Jones. Everyone. So when Mr. D approached me last spring to ask if I'd be interested in presenting to Journal Club, I thought, well, that's an interesting proposition. I'll have to think, you know, if I really want to do that, and what would I as a historian talk about scientists do about? But then I thought, well, you know, disease has played a significant role in human history, um, especially if you look at pandemics, you know, like the Black Death, etc. Um, one of the most important diseases that you may or may not have heard of is the 1918 Spanish flu influenza pandemic, which killed a number of people. And luckily enough, they've done recent research on the pandemic uh, virus and sort of reconstituted the genome and are doing experiments about it. So I'm going to be talking to you today about this article uh, from 2007 in Nature, um, there have been recent, more recent journal articles uh, published about the 1918 virus as well, but we'll look at this one in particular because it's one of the first to really look at uh, the 1918 virus in non-human primates. But before we start, I advertise this as something as a blend of history, mythology, and science. And you might think, mythology, how does that play in? But I like Sydney's characterization of this as the Jurassic Parkification, I guess, of the um, of virus. So I'm going to kind of play off of that and think, get you thinking about this um, Greek myth of Pandora, which you might have heard of before. Pandora's box is a pretty common phrase. But if you don't remember the Greek myth in particular, I'll just give you a nutshell version. Um, so Pandora apparently was the first human woman in Greek mythology. She was created at the behest of Zeus, who wanted to punish Prometheus, who had given fire to humankind. So he had Pandora created and given all these different attributes, curiosity being one of them. So he gave Pandora to Prometheus's brother with a vase that she was not supposed to open, but she didn't know it. And out of her innate curiosity, she opened it and released all the evils that have plagued humankind since the beginning of humankind. The only thing she saved was hope in the box to sort of preserve some um, comfort for humankind in their travails on Earth. So when you, as I talk about this, I want you to think about that Greek myth, that idea of releasing something and not knowing what the ramifications of it might be. Because when I was reading this article and thinking about the you know, extreme disaster that the 1918 flu actually um, in, in, impacted the world, the way it impacted the world, I thought about this. Um, Pandora's myth. So um, a little bit of history to go uh, before I start talking about the article itself. Um, in 1918, you have the emergence of what they called the Spanish flu. Um, they actually say that this flu itself originated in the United States. It didn't originate in Spain. But one of the reasons why they called it the Spanish flu at the time was that in Spain, 8 million people died in the month of May in 1918. And also, Spain didn't have censorship like most other countries did who were involved in the war itself. If you've studied American history, you know, you know that the Committee on Public Information um, under Woodrow Wilson, at least in the United States, censored and controlled the press to some degree as it did in other countries. In Spain, it did not. So it was labeled the Spanish flu because there were many news stories coming out of, Sa of Spain saying that you know, millions of people are dying of this really, really strong flu virus. They actually didn't think it was influenza at the beginning. They thought it was meningitis or something like meningitis because the um, symptoms and the pathology of cadavers once they autop autopsied them after death was so strong, uh, like the, 
it, it reminded people of the Black Death. They actually thought it was the bubonic plague to begin with, um, before they began to realize that this was actually a really extreme version of a flu virus. Um, the mortality rate was about 2.5%, which was much higher than any previous flu virus um, that was measured. Um, the United States uh, Army actually is one of the best resources for data about the influenza virus and the number of people who actually were infected by the influenza virus. So they extrapolated um, that about 25% of the entire American population had the flu virus in 1918 to 1919. Um, this information I'm getting from an environmental historian's work on the 1918 virus um, that was published actually before the genome was mapped. Um, one of the ways it spread so quickly was the fact that American men were being sent over to Europe in the hundreds of thousands <clears throat> in a few months span. So originate, originating in the United States, they think maybe around Kansas, maybe in Massachusetts, they're not quite sure where, but sending as many American troops over as they did actually exacerbated the spread of the virus because they were essentially shipping it over to Europe where it would spread from there. Um, it started in March of 1918. By July, it had made its way around the world, essentially. Um, and it killed between 20, at the very uh, sort of low estimate, to 50 million people. Um, and the article, if you read the article that I read, um, they were pegging it at about 50 million people worldwide were killed as a result of the flu. Now, it wasn't just the flu virus, it was also complications of the flu virus. A lot of people died of pneumonia um, complications after getting the virus because their immune systems were extremely weakened. Um, you'll see why uh, they might have died of pneumonia when I get to the results of the actual journal article. Um, and then here is, um, this sort of works, doesn't work. Um, here is a um, poster from the American Department of Public Health warning people about the Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, part of the problem, too, with uh, this pandemic in particular is that the Departments of Public Health didn't even really know what to do. There was no quarantine. They actually had uh, American soldiers crowded into camps, which exacerbated the spread and, and made it spread faster. Um, and as I said, they didn't diagnose it correctly to begin with. They didn't know what they were dealing, dealing with. Um, so, you know, part of the, some historians argue that this particular strain, uh, strain of flu actually altered the course of World War I. It might have gone longer, there might have been a different outcome, had not so many thousands of soldiers died and people died, and it weakened sort of the human capacity um, that was fueling World War I. Um, now to the article itself. So, the article itself um, is a pretty, it's a pretty small study, which I find kind of problematic to some degree because they only have 10 animals that are test animals. And of course, you have this sort of ethics of using, uh, you know, live animals as a subject for doing scientific experiments, especially when they know that the end outcome will be euthanasia. Um, but that's another thing we can discuss. Uh, but there's only 10 that this group of people in um, a, li a laboratory in Winnipeg, Canada, um, decided to infect them with the 1918 virus, which was actually mapped. The genome was mapped in 2005, and it was published in Nature. Um, this is a 2007 article in Nature that I'm talking about. So just a few years after they mapped the genome of the virus, they chose to do non-human non primate experiments. There had been one experiment done on mice before, and they found that it was extremely virulent. It was extremely deadly. But of course, mice are not humans, um, and they wanted to test something on uh, an animal that was as similar as you can get to the human Homo sapiens and see what the effects might be. Um, so that's kind of the goal of the study itself, was just to look at the virus-host interaction and see if they could determine why um, the virus was so extremely virulent. So as I said, they had a small study, um, and. One thing to note too, I was talking to Dr. Darcilio about the sort of methodology of this journal. This was conducted at a biosafety level four um, sort of laboratory, which means the highest level of security available, meaning that there's no cure for this uh, vaccine. And it's up there with smallpox in terms of you know, its deadly nature. Um, so these researchers took 10 macaque monkeys infected three with 
the uh, sort of common uh, human influenza virus, K173 is what they called it, and then they infected seven with the 1918 virus that they had reconstituted using the genome that was mapped uh, in 2005. And what they did was um, use the K173 animals as control animals. Um, and at days three, six, and eight, euthanized one control um, macaque or, and two or three um, macaques that had the 1918 virus and did various sort of tests on different parts of their body. What I'm going to be focusing on is the data that was found from the swabs, the tissue swabs, um, the tests on the blood serum, and then also gene expression as, as mapped by the looking at the mRNA. Um, and all of these together sort of show the extreme virulence of the 1918 virus and its potential danger to um, you know humans if it ever was released again into the human population. Um, so here, you may not be able to tell very well, but this is, um, if you come closer, or I can send it to you if you want, or if you have a copy of the journal article, look at it. This is uh, tissue samples that were taken from macaques on days three and eight. Um, and these are the different types of tissue samples that were taken. So sample from the, um, the nose, the heart, the spleen, and then uh, uh, the lungs and then the bronchi and tonsils, so a lot of the respiratory system. Um, the control is green, and uh, the unit of measurement is platforming units, so the, essentially the amount of virus that was found in these tissue samples in these different areas of the body. The control, meaning the K173 um, animal, do you guys have a pointer that has like a red thing that works? Yeah, okay, because it's easier to point out with that. Um, the green is here, these two spots, so that's the nose and the bronchi, um, and that's day three. On day three, uh, day eight, post-infection for the K173 animal, you only see the virus plaque, uh, forming plaque units in the tonsil. The other bars, the other bars are actually the um, 1918 infected animals. So you can see that the virus actually was persistent in the animals through day three, six, and eight. I omitted day six because just to compare day three and eight. So you can see, um, so you can see that the virus is only present in a few places of the body. It's the common human influenza virus, but it's all over the body if it's the 1918 virus. And what does it indicate? You know, if you see it in four different places for K173, but only one place in post, post uh, day eight post-infection for K173. You see it in more places in day three and not in day eight. Does that sort of indicate? Body's fighting off. off. It's getting healthier. Um, whereas in 1918 infected by our, uh, animals, you can see that it's actually increasing the platforming units. So that means that in terms of the tissue swabs, the animals were um, being highly affected and continually affected. Another thing to note is that the original protocol was to euthanize the, eight, the animals at day 21, but they chose to euthanize the rest of the animals at day 8 for the 1918 infected animals because they had reached the pre-approved um, sort of measurements for euthanasia. So they progressed to a point at which the researchers said we need to euthanize these animals. They won't last to day 21; they would die. So uh, they had to, they had to alter their um, their protocol, which is another thing to consider. Um, another thing they measured was the um, serum, the blood of animals. And they looked at cytokines and chemokines, which are um, the body's initial response when it's fighting off a disease, it's the initial immunological response. Um, one of the most remarkable things they found was that interleukin-6, which is a protein issued by the body, um, in the early stages of fighting off a disease, um, actually uh, in, like exponentially grew in terms of its production in the body in the 1918 infected animals, whereas in the K173 animals, it stayed pretty constant. So this indicates to the researchers that the body is having an overzealous response 
to the virus itself and is uh, undergoing what they call a cytokine storm in science. And apparently they started using that phrase in the early 1990s, a cytokine storm, kind of going off of desert storm in the early 1990s. Um, I was reading up about like what it actually meant. Um, but it indicates that, you know, this is the expression of this particular gene and indicating that the body itself doesn't know what to do with this particular virus. Third metric um, that was used to sort of measure the virulence of this particular virus um, was a microarray analysis done on gene expression of um, those cytokines and chemokines. Um, and this is the best graph, there's three different graphs, um, but uh, this is that's what I think to sort of visually represent the difference between K133 and 1918 um, virus. So this is uh, genes that were taken from um, bronchi in the macaques at days three, six, and eight. The red um, is meaning positive fold change, meaning that um, Z body is upregulating the emission of cytokines or chemokines. Um, so meaning that it's it's emitting those genes more, meaning that it's trying to fight the body more, or fight the virus and the, the virus in the body more. The green means that it's downregulated, meaning that the gene expression is going back to quote unquote normal. Um, on the left you can see K173. So here both animals essentially have red. The genes are upregulated, the gene expression is upregulated. But in K173 on day six and day eight, it's going green, so it's downregulating, going back to normal. Whereas in 1918, it continues to have positive fold change or gene expression of those cytokines and chemokines, meaning that the body is, it's just another way of representing the body is still fighting off that, that infection, still attempting to fight off the infection, and it's abnormal, it's atypical because the typical um, virus reaction would be totally different. It would be sort of downregulating. It would be total human influence virus. Last thing to think about when it's, um, you know, the one of the last things they measured when they looked at the animals. So I'm going to show you some images. Thinking that the people who labeled the 19, people who had the 1918 virus and died of it in 1918, Purple death. Which of these lungs do you think represents the 1918 infected macaques? Which one? I know I have to gross you out the, you know, this morning. I haven't eaten yet, so I'm not going to throw up. Oh, thanks, Jake. So, which of these do you think represents the 1918 infected animal? Volunteers. Kevin. Yeah. Left, yes. Why? It does look worse. <laughs> I thought it kind of looked like a bot, like someone had thrown it against the wall. <laughs> um, and you can see on the right, that's a pretty normal, normal looking heart lung. So this is um, a massively hemorrhaging uh, lung in the 1918 infected macaque which indicates that the respiratory system of any of a non-human primate is uh, heavily infected. That's where the main, this, the, the virus has the main effect is in the respiratory system, which is why these people die so terribly and sort of drowned in their own sort of the blood that was forming in their lungs. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, really quickly, and now I'm over. Um, the uh, researchers in this journal article were saying, you know, one of the things that needs to be done is more research on the virus-host interaction to try and figure out why the virus itself triggers an atypical response, why the innate immunological response is atypical. Um, so that's kind of what they were suggesting. And they also wondered if other viruses which cause this similar response, if there could be sort of tests done to sort of figure out what could be done to intervene so that the body doesn't have this atypical response. There was a 2014 publication um, that looked at the 1918 virus and argued that one of the reasons people died in great numbers back then is that, uh, and, and they were young people, which was another atypical thing. People who died between the ages of 20 and 40, which is not usually people who died of those, um, 
they think that it's something that you would like immune, immunological um, resistance that has been built up as children. But I return to Pandora. Why are we regenerating this 1918 virus if it killed 50 million people 100 years ago? What are the ethics of actually regenerating a virus that had been eliminated? Not to say that it wouldn't come back again, that it wouldn't mutate again. They think it's a, a variation of an avian flu. Um, but why actually purposely recreate it and do experiments with it, especially if you have to have it at a biosafety level? I actually have a question. I don't know if you, if anyone can answer that, but do you know how about um, maybe Mr. Dean knows something like that? The fire safety level four. Is there like any history of failures of that? Like how consistent has it been proven to effectively contain diseases? Well, I know smallpox got out from an old NIH facility last year in the United States. Smallpox, which you know is not a nice disease. It strikes me that the answer to that question relies a lot on how well our capacity to contain the disease is. Yeah. <clears throat> Will we do it yeah. Anyone else? Dave. Well, we still have everybody else has to say it. seems to me that if you want to know how to cure a disease, you have to have a disease to study. And, yeah, it could regenerate in the wild. Somebody could elsewhere could purposely regenerate it. I'd like to have a little vaccine. Fair point. Yeah. I have a question about the earlier. Um, I, I read the paper, so I don't know if anybody else knows this, but did they, uh, did the 1918 virus, did it affect mice, monkeys, and humans, or was it altered to affect mice? Okay. So you have evidence from a cat. Right, and mice. Mice. And obviously it affected, affected humans. Was it the same, the same exact virus that did all those things? I don't know if you can say it's the same exact virus because we can't know that the gene, the, the rematch genome that they mapped in 2005 is the exact same thing as it was in, 20, in 1918. Like, I don't know where they got that source. Yeah. Before you, do you know? Are, are you just asking about cross species infection? Like, does the same virus infect all? Yeah, was it a cross species virus, or did they adapt? You know, it I I read the paper too, and I did not catch. I was looking through the methodology late last night. I don't yeah. remember reading that, but I don't remember. Reading that. Yeah. Okay. Because if it if it does all three species species species. <laughs> <laughs> It died out, it actually ran its course about 18 months later. Um, so it sort of emerged in the spring of 1918 by 1920, it was kind of gone. Um, I think it re-emerged in smaller pockets after that. But like any virus that mutates, like uh, influenza virus that mutates, you know, you get a flu shot, well, I don't know if you guys do, but I get a flu shot every year, and you have to redo the formula, essentially, the mix, because they have to integrate what the mutations were from the past year into the new vaccine. So I think it just mutated past that point. But for some reason, that particular strain was extremely deadly because it affected the respiratory system so badly. And another thing that was complicated was that a lot of people died of pneumonia at the time. So, you know, if it came about now, we might have better health care people without pneumonia. Um, I don't know, it's kind of a big what if. Yeah. Since it came out in like the spring of 19, does that mean that like the winter season was a really bad flu season? Uh, that I don't. That I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. I think that they didn't think it was the flu because it wasn't the winter when it started. So they thought it was meningitis or something like that. Okay. Andrew, you have a question?